Look, I think it's the machines have taken over. And what you're seeing in the marketplace is this constant, you know, draining of liquidity. So I think it's a, a whole combination of things out there. Uh, the Fed has clearly been move, moving rates higher, which is drawing some out. And they're also, you know, taking some of the, uh, the bonds off their balance sheets. So you've got this double-edged sword that's hitting the, the market for now. But I, I think the time to be nervous has already passed. Um, you know, a lot of people sell at the bottom, and I, and I don't think this is a time when investors should be out there selling, but maybe reevaluating what the portfolio looks like and then rebalancing it to get into 2019. So when we th we used to say, or, or people would suggest when Gary Cohn was still uh, the chief economist in the White House, that he was worth a couple thousand points on the Dow. Um, he left, and that wasn't actually the case at the time. Um, who do you think, if, if you're the president right now and you want the market to go back up by a couple thousand points, what, what could he do? Greatest stimulus he has in his back pocket is solving China right now. I think if you can bring back confidence that we're going to get out of a trade war, we've resolved some of the issues, you know, that are very important to the U.S. economy. I mean, theft of intellectual property is a major problem that I don't think we could have continued down. But if you look to 2020, the general election, the biggest stimulus he has in his pocket under his control is to resolve China. Correct me if I'm wrong. You said draining of liquidity seemed to be the primary reason that you thought that we were having a sell-off here, right? Here at the end of the year, going into year-end, I think you're also in a time period when, you know, losses actually can be realized, and people haven't done that for the past few years. So you balance out the gains that you realize in the early part of the year, you're selling, and so there's this liquidity drain out of the market, but it is going to hit a bottom. You know, we may see sharp Vs. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to underline the difference between the turmoil in Washington and people being upset with the president and then the very basic fact that the Fed is both raising interest rates and draining the balance and, and uh, reducing the size of the balance sheet very steadily. Yep. Right? You've got to cut through the noise, right? And as a long-term investor, you, you have to take out the short-term noise that's, that's right. you know, causing some concern and look towards the long-term. And I think the long-term is, you know, do we get to a point when the Fed stops raising rates? Uh, you know, I do think that they're going to be on a pause in 2019. So for the whole um, year? Not for the whole year, because I think you'll probably begin to see economic growth beginning to lift at the let, end of the year. Rich, let me just bring you into this uh, real quickly. Do you think we're going to sure. have a, mul a number of rate hikes next year? No. Um, we, last week with Joe, I was even talking about it. I think uh, December is going to be it for a while. Then they're going to be data dependent. Um, and to your, you know, to your uh, guest point, the liquidity... Uh, in the short run is being dri driven by algos and other things, but we don't, we don't think we're going to be in a sustained uh, bear market here. Uh, valuations are just too cheap, and investors have to really avoid what uh, one of my partners, is a, who's a uh, former psychiatrist, uh, calls the bear market depression syndrome, and right. how to avoid making bad decisions and in this period of time so is really can critical. we just talk about that so the the journal has this article on the front page this morning stock route fueled by market on auto um effectively says about 28 percent of the market is algos unto themselves when you add passive and everything else with it it's like 85 percent of the market so when you're talking about sort of where you see the market and you know the fundament there are the fundamentals and these issues of the Fed, no question, but all of it exacerbated. I mean, the question is how much of is this being exacerbated by But you know what I wonder computers? about that? Has the proportion of passive to active changed that much? In other words, so if you're... A, over the last five years, yes. Over the last year, no. It, but if you're the investor class, it's the old Ben Graham, Graham thing, right? The Mr. Market knocks on the door and says, here's my price today. Right. If there are people out there who know what these companies should be worth, and they're getting a better and better and better price, I don't know why everyone's... Claim, I, yeah, I understand I, if the moves are, are wider than they, they might have otherwise been. For active been, managers, but. it's a great opportunity. I mean, I see a tremendous amount of value in, in individual stock names that we have done fundamental research behind, we're really excited about. But with the draining of liquidity, it's, again, hard to the fight the Fed. There, we have, we're conflating a lot of different kinds of liquidity. You're talking about the Fed selling bonds from its balance sheet. Rich was talking about liquidity in the markets, the markets right, right, Rich? Right, Yeah, and, and don't forget... With the algos, you know, when you get into these kind of cycles, Andrew and, and Kelly, you know, when you get you go from fear to anxiety to panic, right? And as an individual analyst or portfolio manager, you have to really manage that panic because you start making bad decisions. The algos are going to feed into that panic, especially without a, um, a downtick rule in place. By the same token, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Well, Rich, as I say, you mentioned that valuations are starting to look attractive again now, but uh, these algo factors you're talking about, were they not what took things like the FANG stocks way above a typical valuation earlier in the year, and therefore valuations aren't really going to support the market whilst the momentum's to the downside? Yeah, but it, the, I think the, the um, momentum stocks, you know, in the last few years, five or six names were a majority of that return. And the street's at $176 in earnings. We're at 171 Even if you take a haircut off of that, we're, we're trading below 15 times earnings. The risk, the big risk, is if the consumer really continues to be spooked and feels that, oh, the economy is going to slow, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, which could put us into a recession earlier than we think, which we do not think is 2019. Yeah. So this is very classic parts of kind of but can we investor just go back to behavior even, around even the holiday sure. shopping issue do you think that come january 20th and i don't know where the market's going to be uh you know in a month from now but it's assuming that we're in the same place or somewhere near this place do you think that that's going to have a real material impact on people's shopping habits meaning people are going to look at their statement and go oh I didn't realize it was actually that bad. I mean, by the way, how many tables around the country, uh, Christmas table dinners, we're, were about, about this? I, retirees, others saying, last what am I going to do? <laughs> but, yeah, last year is year's Bitcoin. <laughs> this year, it's so, actually the market. Yeah. Andrew, I've been doing this a long time. What my, what, for, for retail investors, when you get into these crazy periods in the market, people tend not to open up their statements. And they but tend everyone not to go checks online, online Rich, right? Do, does everybody check online these days or no? Is that still a small portion? Well, I think people love to check online when things are good, right? That's part of like the, the bull market greed sense. But when you get into these levels of anxiety and fear, people just say, oh, it's, it's way too stressful for me to go online. I'm just not going to do it today. I'll wait till there's an update and then I'll look. Rich, do they liquidate their port port portfolios? No, no. So one of, the things that, one of the things we look at uh, in our firm over the last 25 years is we have not gotten the GMO calls yet, the get me outs. When you get the get me out calls, then you know you're close to a bottom. We are getting, should I get out? Hmm. And that's where there's a lot of coaching. You know, our clients are foundations and high net worth individuals. So we're not getting any of the GMO calls yet. Um, but that would be a really positive sign that we're, that we're in a bottoming Chris, process. do you think when people look at their statements, if they are waiting until they're forced to in January, that there's going to be a negative feedback loop? Uh, certainly can because they overreact at the bottom and that's what we would tell clients is, is don't sell here at the bottom. I, you know, I agree with the other guests that I mean, we're not facing an economic recession next year. I mean, you're facing a wall of worry. We're probably going to have some earnings recession after a great year. You know, things will slow. Uh, but I think if that growth continues in, uh, you know, the Fed is not there to help on the multiple expansion next year. But if growth in the economy continues, which we think will happen, you know, the market can continue to move forward.